So chapter 63 begins with <clears throat> some pretty powerful imagery regarding Christ's atonement as well as the Savior's second coming. So there are some interesting word plays going on. Remember that often uh, the, in the ancient Hebrew writing system, they would use word play as the special effects to make the, the reading more interesting and to help highlight key themes. And the theme here is red, as in blood red in the atonement of Jesus Christ. So here's words to listen for. Edom, which is related to the word red, and also look at um, dyed garments and so forth. And here we go. Who is this that cometh from Edom, the country of redness, with dyed garments from Bozrah, that this is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? I that speak in, in righteousness, mighty to save. His atonement is mighty to save. Wherefore out the, art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? So in the ancient world, when they would create wine, they would gather all the grapes, they put it in a pit, and they would stomp on it. And you hear this phrase that Jesus tread the wine press alone. It is a lot of work to stomp on grapes to get some wine. And when you do that, I've done this when I was a student at the Jerusalem program at BYU many years ago, you jump in there and they tell you, wear clothes that you don't care about because they will be permanently stained with wine or grape juice. And it's a very messy, energetic, and uh, uh, energy depleting process. When God says, I tread the wine press alone. In the ancient world, it was meant to be a happy occasion because people like to drink things beyond water. And wine or grape juice was one of the few options they had. But it was a huge amount of work, and people get together in a party and joyful atmosphere, and they'd sing songs as they're all in this big vat, all stomping together. Jesus worked out salvation for all of us. He feeds us the delicious wine or grape juice of his atonement. And he's the only one that made it possible. You have all these beautiful symbols of redness, that his garments are dashed red with the blood of the grape, that he himself is represented by. So you see the phrase that Taylor already mentioned right there in verse 3, I have trodden the winepress alone. If you want to cross-reference that to Doctrine and Covenants section 76 verse 107 or section 88 verse 106, the Lord's going to repeat that phrase and then he adds a little uh, addendum to the end of the phrase when he's speaking to Joseph Smith in those two sections. He'll say, I've trodden the winepress alone, even the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Now we enter into a, a, a very hmm, a very sacred realm in this part of the scripture because you'll notice there are some things coming out here in the second half of verse 3 that at first when we read Isaiah's words, it feels troubling to us. It doesn't seem to line up with our our perception of the character of Christ. Let me show you what I mean. Verse 1, or sorry, verse 3, starting with the word, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, for their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment. It sounds strange to picture him on, on the cross or in Gethsemane with anger and, and fury and this vengeance kind of an idea. Verse 4, for the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And we're saying, wait, these two things don't seem to line up. The infinite atonement should be this loving, merciful, kind, and gracious thing, not this, not this fury. Look at verse 5, it goes even further. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury, it upheld me. A thought that I learned from, from Sean Hopkin on this is the idea, if you just shift your thinking and look at this verse from a, from a totally different angle, you say, hmm, the fury, the anger, what would that be aimed at? Is it aimed at you? Is it aimed at us? Or is it aimed at sin, at death, at hell, at the devil, at all of those who do uphold his work? It's as if he is engaged with our enemy and he's filled with that, that divine uh, vengeance 
to, to fight our battles for us. He, he is going to war for us, and it upheld him. He is fighting for my soul and your soul, and it gets him through that, those untold agonies. It's just a different way to look at the, what at first might seem a little out of place, and then you put it in that context, and you say, wow, he went to war for me. He fought to redeem our soul. Wow, how great thou art. Can I add one thought to that too? As you were talking about, um, there's a couple phrases in here that, that tears my heart a little bit, actually. One of the things I love that you said is, in that moment he is with the vengeance, but I also went to Luke 20 or 42, 22, 42, and it says, and being in agony, maybe it was 43, he prayed more earnestly. And I thought of the pattern that when we feel like we're at war, or and he is, what he, what he calls upon Father's power beyond his own to be able to do this. Um, the other space that was, I, I don't know, it, so hard for me, verse 3, I trod in the wine press alone, and there was none with me. I looked in verse 5, and there was none to help. And it just has caused me to think when the Savior, I know what it means for me to grab for him. In that moment, he looks and I, I'm not saying I wasn't there to help, but it does cause me the question now, when he looks to do his work, to send somebody on his errand, am I there to help? And, uh, and it reminds me also in verse 3, with none was with him, of the Elder Holland when Elder Holland spoke, and even as a message, right, where he's, it's titled, None Were With Him, and he testifies of the Savior's ability that he suffered such a long, lonely road so we don't have to. And without making this a long lesson in loneliness, I can testify that loneliness is no respecter of persons. And I have spent a lot of time pondering over sitting in loneliness and wondering where God is in my loneliness, but also knowing that I've never experienced loneliness like the Savior has. And as I read this, while it breaks my heart, it fills me with gratitude for a God who is always available in our loneliness. He lets us suffer. There's purpose in it. Uh, He actually helps us become like him in a really weird way, but it does. And I just testify that, um, and maybe because it leads to verse 7, 2, right? I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord hath bestowed upon us, and the great goodness towards the house of Israel, which he hath bestowed upon them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. That's not one. That's not one time he's nice. There's multitudes. And I just love that attribute of him as well, that he is full of loving kindness. Whether we identify it as loving kindness or not, I'm grateful for a father who doesn't give me everything that I want. I really am. That's a good parent. And uh, I just love that that is, if we have eyes to see, we can see that he's full of loving kindnesses. And notice, using this parenting analogy, <clears throat> verse 8 says, For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their savior. It's beautiful, this identity. Oh, and by the way, verse 9, you can see some allusions to that angel that is mentioned as as Lori already uh, took us to Luke 22, 43 and 44. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of of his presence saved them. Jesus knows something about the presence of an angel in a moment of deep suffering because it seems to be one of the only things that he gets through the entire process of his infinite agonies of atonement where the Lord sends an angel. And by the way, you only get that angel mentioned in Luke's gospel. Ironic, Luke, the physician, is the only one to mention the the comforting presence of an angel at a couple of points uh, or a few points there in that process.